Jan Lieskovský and Martin Preisler with his presentation. Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Martin Preisler. I, I work at Red Hat. And today with my colleague Jan Lieskowski, we'll be talking about uh, how you can use SCAP to secure the cloud. So uh, there was a talk yesterday by, by Josh Bressers called Security, Everything is on Fire. So just in case you weren't scared enough by that, we will try again. So everything indeed is on fire, and there are several types of fires. Uh, we will discuss how to fight two of them. One uh, is about software flaws, so having, having unpatched uh, vulnerabilities in the software you have in production deployment. And the second is configuration flaws, having your services configured in such a way uh, that allows uh, attackers to attack your infrastructure. So let's first talk about vulnerabilities. Uh, there are several kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, the first one I would like to talk about are undiscovered vulnerabilities. We can all agree that these are pretty bad, but they are actually uh, the better type of vulnerabilities because they are undiscovered, so it's relatively expensive to exploit them because the details aren't public. Somebody has to invest a lot of effort to find these vulnerabilities and exploit them. What is much worse are known vulnerabilities. So a vulnerability that has an assigned ID, it's well known in the community. Uh, there are details how to attack with those available in public. Some of these vulnerabilities are so bad that they've even received nicknames and, uh, and fancy names lately, like Shellshock, Poodle, and Venom. And probably the most famous vulnerability has even received a logo. <laughs> So we can all agree that vulnerabilities are dangerous and they are a bad thing to have in our infrastructure. We cannot do anything about the unknown vulnerabilities, but let's try to do something about the known ones. Let's try to find some way to prevent having known vulnerabilities in our infrastructure. But this is getting increasingly more difficult because in today's day and age, we have single purpose containers in our infrastructure and single purpose virtual machines. That means that there are uh, many different types. Uh, we no longer, usually we no longer have that one golden image that we can use and, and check. And this diversity of containers is making it more difficult uh, to audit our machines. So we need some sort of automation, some sort of a tool uh, that we can run on our infrastructure. And this tool needs to explore and do everything for us automatically. And I'd like to present uh, such a feature in Atomic, it's fairly new, called Atomic Scan. What Atomic Scan does uh, is you can give it a, a container or a container image, and it'll explore it for CVs. It can scan either one container or one container image by ID or by, uh, by the image name, or it can even scan multiple images, which I will explain later. Uh, the output can be a summary of these results. So in this example, we can see that we have a container that has uh, zero critical vulnerabilities, zero important vulnerabilities, four medium, and uh, zero low severity vulnerabilities. When we use the uh, dash dash detail as a uh, command line uh, parameter, Atomic Scan will give us detailed information about these vulnerabilities, including links uh, to them, to their description. And we can also, if you use dash dash containers or dash dash images, we can scan all the containers we have or all the images we have in our infrastructure. So this, this looks like a pretty nice magical tool, but as a security guy, uh, I want to understand how this works before I trust it, right? So let's very briefly discuss how this works and, and why it works. So the first thing that happens when, when this command is run is we look into the container and we detect the operating system version. So be it RHEL 6, RHEL 7, Fedora, CentOS, or something else. Then according to that version, we need to find the CVE database, so-called CVE feed from the vendor. So for example, if it's RHEL 7, we need to download the RHEL 7 CVE feed from Red Hat. Once we do that, we load it with a tool called OpenSCAP, which we will describe later. And OpenSCAP will uh, 
look into the container and compare the versions of the software in the container with the versions in the CVE database. So if the vendor is giving you data that some version ranges are vulnerable to some vulnerabilities, OpenSCAP will report them. So here is how it works architecturally in, in Atomic Host. We have the host OS with the atomic command. Uh, on the host OS, we have the su a super privileged container where all the functionality is, uh, is encapsulated. Only this privileged, super privileged container has OpenSCAP and OpenSCAP daemon, both projects that uh, power this functionality. And when you call atomic scan, uh, a debug call is issued uh, to the super privileged container, and the super privileged container looks at other containers that are on the host OS to explore them. Okay, but security is a much broader term than just, just vulnerabilities, which we've discussed so far. Uh, we need to discuss the other important uh, part of security, which is getting the configuration right, so-called hardening. So let's discuss this right now. So let's start by explaining what a security policy is. Uh, security policy usually is some sort of a book or a very big binder that's human readable and the auditors, they, they carry it to these companies where they, they audit it. Uh, it contains a list of rules to follow with human readable text about each of them. Usually it's a description of the rule, what the rule is about, uh, some rationale, so why you should comply, comply to this rule or not. And then some guidance is how the auditor can check that you are actually in compliance with this rule or that you're not in compliance. And of course, uh, some guidance how to fix the issue if you're not compliant. As I said, this is usually a PDF, uh, some spreadsheet, or some other human readable text, or even a big book. It's not important really to read this text, but this is just to illustrate. This is a real world uh, security policy called PCI DSS from the payment card industry. And you can see that these are human readable rules, and there's no way we are going to uh, read this and evaluate it for all our containers in our infrastructure. So we need, we need something to make this automated. And I'd like to introduce a standard that does just that, called SCAP. It's a, it's a NIST standard from uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, a USA standards organization. And very simply said, it's a set of data formats for taking these human-readable policies and making machine-readable guidances from them. So this is an example of an, of an SCAP security policy. You can see that it's more structured, and uh, instead of having just human-readable instructions, it also has some uh, bash snippets that you can execute to fix the situation or check. Other than that, it contains very similar information. It contains uh, the descriptions, the guidances, everything the uh, human-readable security policies have. So there are two types of uh, escape security policies, two types of use cases. We've just discussed the first, which is to detect CV vulnerabilities, like hard bleed, shell shock, and so on. And now we're going to discuss security compliance, which is to ensure uh, that your infrastructure is set up according to some security policy. So as an example, when we're doing security compliance, we're asking uh, different questions than with vulnerability assessment. We're asking whether root can log in over SSH. We're asking, for example, if SE Linux is enabled. We're asking if temp is mounted on a separate partition with no exec. We're, we're asking if you're running any obsolete insecure services, and so on. And I mean, just the standard is not enough. We need some sort of implementation uh, to use the standard. OpenSCAP is just that implementation, and it's a project that uh, we're working on at Red Hat. OpenSCAP is a, is a, a SK 1.2 implementation started in 2009. It's NIST certified. And uh, it, it's a library and a command line tool. And, but also, a GUI frontend is available for, for easier use. And I'd like to demonstrate this GUI frontend now. So let's, let's give you an example. Let's scan a single Fedora 23 machine with OpenSCAP and SCAP Workbench. And let's use a common profile 
from, from, a sec from Escape Security Guide, which Jan will introduce later. Let's just use this as an example for now. So the first step we need to do is to install uh, the tools. We need to install two packages, Escape Security Guide and Escape Workbench. After that, we just need to start Escape Workbench. When Escape Workbench starts, you'll see this screen. Uh, let's just ignore customization and profile for now and focus on the rules. Escape Workbench will give you titles of the rules it will check. And when you click scan and wait roughly three or four minutes in this case, Escape Workbench will give you the results with no other interaction necessary. So it'll give you fail and pass results for all these rules. But what if you need to find out why you actually failed uh, for one of these rules? You can click show report and uh, an HTML report opens up in your browser with a breakdown of the results. So in this case, it looks, it looks terrible, like 27 uh, rules passed, and uh, but 40, 46 rules failed. Uh, keep in mind that this was freshly installed Fedora and a pretty strict security policy. But what if we need to explore why some particular rule failed? We can go into the report, uh, find the rule that we're interested in, and uh, when we click it, we see uh, the description of the rule. So in this case, it's a rule about password minimum length, so about password policy. And this rule uh, enforces that users have password of minimum length of at least 12 characters. So we can read the description. And when we scroll down, OpenSCale will explain to us uh, why this rule is failing. So in this case, uh, OpenSCAP says that in uh, it at C login devs, there's a pass min length value of five, whereas it was expecting 12. So now I would like to give the stage to Jan, who will explain more about different security policies. So hello, now, my name is Jan Lieskowski. I work uh, as software engineer in the Red Hat in the same team like Martin. And uh, the primary area of my focus are security standards and security policies. Uh, we try to simplify the application of security standards in uh, different software products. And uh, I have came here to present uh, why you should be interested in security policies, uh, which of them are actually already available, and uh, what will be the next steps. So, why the need for security policies? Uh, there are uh, multiple aspects. Um, one might want the answer to these questions. Uh, I have uh, created a couple of them, and so let's have a look what we have good, what we have got. Uh, well, the first point is uh, Linux distributions are multi-purpose, are intended to be multi-purpose. Uh, of course, one would expect different security requirement for some classroom workstation, another for uh, high-performance computing server, and uh, yet another for some laptops that are expected to be used on airports. Uh, then there are those uh, high-level uh, security standards. For example, payment card industry data security standard, to mention one example. The issue here, or the observation here, is that uh, they are often expressed in um, uh, abstract language. They are universal in the sense they should be applicable to variety of uh, different operating system systems, different software products, and they need to be that universal. Uh, in contrary to that, there are uh, concrete operating system details or concrete software details, like concrete st steps you need to perform to be uh, aligned with that standard. As um, Martin already said, uh, due to the difficulty and the complexity of those standards, there might be a desire to have these uh, things automated. So, uh, SCAP Security Guide. Uh, like um, Martin briefly mentioned, SCAP Security Guide is basically a collection of uh, uh, security policies 
expressed in SCAP protocol format. It's uh, suitable for, uh, it's expected to be suitable for both the humans. Uh, in the sense you can see what the policy will actually perform when you scan the machine. And also to machines, they are expressed in a natural way, so the machine can uh, automatically process them. Uh, like we mentioned, there might be a uh, desire for automation, so SCAP Security Guide provides all the content that is necessary to f fully automate the process of scanning and correcting a system. It's a community project. Uh, if interested, you can uh, contribute. If you find some bug, you can uh, fi file an issue. Uh, it's open source. All, all the uh, content we create is uh, released on the public domain. So uh, this slide uh, presents some policies that are uh, already available. Um, there are uh, two concepts to mention. One is uh, security policy and the other is security profile. Uh, if I should use some uh, simple analogy, uh, we could uh, uh, map security uh, policy to library, uh, library for technical uh, literature, and profile would be uh, more specialized, uh, would cover more specialized uh, subjects like mathematics, physics, and etc. So, for example, here uh, we can see uh, that currently we ship security policies for. Um, RL, Fedora, all those uh, derivative operating systems, uh, also for uh, Debian 8. Uh, what's interesting here is uh, we uh, are not focused anymore on operating systems. Uh, there are also products or software components uh, that are known to have a lot of uh, security flaws and uh, therefore uh, require our attention to create security policies for them. So for example, Firefox or uh, Java are the two main uh, examples of policies you might be interested in, uh, in searching for. Of course, uh, if uh, this picture isn't uh, like, uh, is missing uh, some of your uh, product you would like to see here. It's uh, easy to start contributing. Uh, file bugs, uh, feature requests, uh, provide uh, uh, justification why we should be interested uh, in your product and uh, we might have a talk and uh, can cooperate together. So, uh, security policies. There are, um, uh, like uh, in a any other human activity, there are two uh, sides of the coin, the, the bad news and the good news. The bad news is, like Martin said, that uh, you need to install a separate package uh, when you want to use them. The good news is that uh, uh, in uh, solutions, we often provide uh, the security policies already included. So you don't need to take care for Insta uh, uh, additional installation of these policies, but uh, they are somehow already included there. Example, this is uh, some blog post about some announcement about uh, Red Hat uh, Cloud Forms or Manage IQ. Uh, if you want, uh, the interesting point here is it's uh, uh, 8 November last year and uh, uh, they uh, uh, justified uh, the enhancement in the security area and as you can see they explained that uh, why they are doing it and uh, uh, they uh, added support for uh, security template implementation guide and uh, SCAP protocol. Uh, we can meet security policies also on a local host. Uh, this is the case Martin uh, already uh, introduced. Um, 
basically the very same tool. We can uh, meet them even uh, uh, during uh, installation of operating uh, system, it's not uh, necessary to uh, split the tasks into two steps, like install the operating system and uh, then uh, uh, enforce the security policy. It's uh, uh, possible to merge these two steps into one. Here is an example of a tool which is called Oscar Beneconda Adon. Uh, it's a graphical front end uh, for those that don't like uh, graphical installations. I understand that for those uh, thousands of systems, you probably wouldn't use the graphical interface. There is the uh, kickstart equivalent, so you can uh, use uh, this snippet in um, playbooks and script engines. What's uh, interesting here, uh, basically, the important is just the profile a role where uh, just by uh, changing the profile name you can uh, uh, install a system compliant against uh, different policy. Some example, as I mentioned, uh, Firefox is uh, one of the tools that are pretty uh, uh, carrying pretty a lot of security flaws. This is an example of what a user um, might want to um, harden the Firefox instance more. For example, they might want to disable uh, secure socket wire and replace it uh, with the security on the transport wire. Uh, a note here, these rules aren't interconnected uh, somehow. You don't need to use all of them, it's uh, enough uh, to specify just one of them, it's enough to specify any subset. There is no relation, this is just an example. An another example for the Firefox Valley, uh, what might be interesting is to enable the certificate validation. Maybe uh, all of you remember all those warnings that uh, uh, this uh, certificate is untrusted and uh, if you want to accept the exception. Uh, another example might be if you are bothered by those uh, Firefox uh, windows show, showing up, uh, you might want uh, to set or specify enable this uh, uh, rule. Uh, the nature of the question is uh, how were these uh, policies created? So I will speak a bit uh, just motivation why we would want to customize the policy. Here is an uh, example of a PCI DSS a rule uh, requiring uh, some password length and uh, uh, the categories to be present in the password. We can see they require seven characters and two categories. Of course, this, does, uh, this uh, doesn't need to be uh, sufficient for each uh, individual developer company, so they might want to strengthen or vice versa, weaken the existing policy, strengthen in the sense they might want to specify or require uh, four categories or less categories in the case for weakening it. Another um, use case, why? To interest in policy customization is to create your own one completely from scratch. Here is an example again using Escape Workbench uh, uh, how we can customize a policy. What's interesting here for us is basically just the customize button. And uh, here is how we would uh, do that. Uh, we would uh, in the top uh, we would uh, use the deselect all button and specify just those rules we would like to use. In this example, I have created a picture for the first case of, of Firefox policy, like uh, disabling uh, secure socket wire and enabling uh, transport wire security. Um, you might be interested in, in more details how to customize the policies. So, uh, 
we understand that this is like a complex topic. It's difficult to customize them. And we have created a, a dedicated portal to uh, all the tools and policies related with OpenSCAP. Uh, here is an uh, example of the tutorial focusing uh, in more detail how to customize a security policy. But uh, you can find there a lot of uh, additional information about the tools we present here today and about security policies, etc. So check it out. The question might be, uh, we have presented that, uh, a lot of tools and uh, a lot of policies, and if there is anything left uh, for, for the future, there is uh, a lot of things have, has been done, and if there is anything we still need to do. So the question, the answer is for sure. And uh, to speak about it in more detail, we want the policies and also the tools uh, to be integrated uh, with uh, more uh, technologies, to mention some examples like uh, Docker, OpenShift, OpenStack, uh, Red Hat Enterprise virtualization, virtualization Solution. So if you are interested uh, in these uh, technologies and uh, the topic of secur security policies, uh, got uh, like sounds like a fun for you. We can we can have a talk. Uh, we can cooperate in the future together. So that's for my part. Thank you. Okay, so Jan uh, Jan has talked about uh, how you can get the content for infrastructure. And let's now talk how to really deploy it. Uh, we've used GUI tools, which uh, is useful in some use cases, but sometimes you don't even have an XORG server available. So you need some command line tools to use. I uh, won't explain this in great detail, but just keep in mind that what we've shown in the GUI tools can also be accomplished uh, with the command line OSCAP tool. We also have uh, convenience wrappers to scan containers and VMs. The advantage of those uh, is that you don't need to install any tools in the virtual machine or container. You can scan them from the outside, which is what security people usually like. They don't like to install uh, new software in their production. Okay, so we've made it much easier. We've come from the, from the book, from the binder, from the human readable text, and we now have some machine, uh, machine readable policy. But we've only done solicited one-off scanning. So the system administrators, they still have to load the policy manually and scan each machine manually. And this is, uh, this is not enough. Because if something needs to be done manually, people will just ignore it in, in time and uh, they just won't, they just will stop do the compliance. So let's now discuss how we can accomplish uh, scanning some resource continuously. For example, scanning a container every Sunday around midnight. So for that, I'd like to introduce a new project uh, in the OpenSCAP uh, world called OpenSCAP Daemon. Instead of being a tool, it's a service. Uh, when it runs, it provides a Dbus interface. There's a command line tool available for interaction, but it just issues the Dbus commands to the daemon. A uh, central task in the, in the daemon is, is called uh, task, central concept. And the task is about evaluation of some resource. So usually a task contains the content, uh, the profile, which resource you want to scan, and when you want to scan it, so some sort of a schedule. Tasks can be evaluated on demand or, or scheduled, as I said. Another goal when creating this project was to make it a bit more interactive, because as you could see in the OSCAP tool, you need to uh, put in very long uh, IDs of the profiles. And this is a big pain, even for me. So uh, when creating the tool, we made it more interactive. When you're creating a task, the daemon uh, gives you a list of uh, probable choices. So for example, here I'm creating uh, a task to scan a remote machine every Friday. And when I press enter after setting the target, the daemon tells me the escape security guide contents that are available. And I just need to put in a number so in this case, I'm scanning a uh, RHEL 7 machine, I believe. So I'll put in a 9. And after pressing Enter again, 
the daemon will figure out wh which profiles are available, and again, it will let me just type a number and pick the profile. So I think from the usability perspective, this is a big improvement uh, over typing the IDs manually. So in this slide, I've made a screenshot of a task overview. I've created a task for everything uh, the daemon can scan. So that's the local bare metal machine, a Docker container, a Docker image, a virtual machine that's either running or shut down, or a storage image or a remote machine. So it's, it's, uh, it's like a showcase of what the daemon can do. We really tried to uh, unify the scanning interface in the daemon so that you can scan all the resources in the same way. So after you've created the tasks and they're scheduled and they're running, you need to uh, get their results. So this slide demonstrates how to do that. You can get overview of all the results. Uh, the daemon only stores the machine readable results and the HTML reports we've shown are generated always uh, on demand and, and they're thrown away immediately. For debugging, you can also get standard output or standard error from the daemon from all the, all the results. So I've very briefly introduced the daemon uh, for, for continuous scanning, but keep in mind that it's a pretty new project and it's designed for smaller deployments. If you have, if you have a deployment with uh, hundreds or even more machines, you probably want to look into Foreman, which we think is more, more production ready and is more suitable for these large deployments. So I'd like to show you uh, how it works in the Foreman. The concepts should be familiar by now, but uh, you're also creating a policy, choosing the content, choosing the schedule, and, uh, and choosing what to scan. After the compliance policies are created, you can also see the results uh, from all the machines and uh, view the report. The reports are also generated on demand, and they are the same familiar reports in Workbench and in the daemon, integrated into the formal interface. Thanks for your attention. Uh, this is all. Are there any questions? Yes? Is it possible later in the form for uh, OSCAP team to have it take actions upon failure, like if something's out of compliance, shut down, just you know, stop its container, throw it or shut down its uh, So the question was, is there anything in the daemon or in Foreman uh, that when a, ma when a machine or a container is out of compliance, it can perform some sort of an action? Uh, there are. Uh, fixes in the escape content, so you can run remediation and remedi remedy the situation. So in case some service is installed and, and shouldn't be there, like RSH, it runs uh, yum uninstall RSH and it stops the service. Uh, we have some plans to uh, like undeploy uh, containers that are vulnerable, but these, these are just plans uh, for now. So are there any other questions? Yes? So the question was, are we scanning uh, package data for the known CVs in vulnerability scanning? Uh, yes, we are only scanning for known CVs. There's, as far as I know, there's no way to scan for unknown CVs, and we're only scanning for the RPM package version. So we're comparing version ranges uh, with the versions of packages that are installed. Uh, any other questions? Yes? So the question was, in Escape Workbench, uh, if I don't have a browser installed, can I view the results? Uh, what you could do is you could save the machine readable results and then open them in VI, but that's very inconvenient. You could also save the HTML report and open it with links or some other browser, but I guess that's, again, a browser. But okay, my assumption is if you're hiding your system, you don't have a browser. Ah, okay. So the question was, if I'm hardening a system, I probably don't have a browser. So in this case, I recommend uh, using Escape Workbench from some machine where you have a desktop system, and you can use it, and scan a remote machine. So you can do all the, br all the browsing machine. Any other question? Yes. Maybe it does this already, but is there some way where you can, you know, click on a button, you know, hopefully it forces you to 
So the question was, does Workbench support running the remediations for you on a remote machine? Uh, I'll see if I have a screenshot of this somewhere in here. There's a, there's a remediate checkbox uh, on bottom right. If you, if you check that and click scan, it authenticates, it runs the scan, and for failed results, it then runs the remediations automatically on the machine. That's a pretty good feature request, but we don't support that yet in SK Workbench. If, if I could uh, step into this, I would say that you can uh, like uh, initially scan the system, uh, realize that there are those uh, 10 failures, and create a custom policy, like you would ju select just those three rules and uh, run the remediation just against those three rules. So the question was, can we also scan uh, according to some events instead of just a fixed schedule? Uh, we are looking into these options, but uh, right now we can only scan according to a schedule. Any other questions? Yes? So if the scan is done in root, we don't allow root SSH access, how do we the scan? That's a very good question. So if we have a security policy that, the, so the question was, if you have a security policy that disables root access over SSH, how do we scan remotely? We have support, we have something called OSCAP SSH, which is a wrapper script. It can do SSH and then sudo on the machine, scan and return the results back. So that's one option uh, you can use. Uh, you can also scan like containers and VMs, you can scan from the outside. So even if you don't have any like SSH access to them, you can scan them from the outside. Uh, in Escape Workbench, there's a feature request for this, but it's not implemented yet. Uh, I would like to implement the same sudo support, so you can log in as a normal user that's in the wheel group, and then uh, sudo when you're logged in. Any other questions? Yes? So the question was, uh, do we do some uh, research? on performance impact of the scanning. Uh, to be honest, it really depends on the content. There's some content that is very demanding. Uh, for example, if you're checking that all the set to ID binaries come from RPMs, you need to check basically every file on the file system. So we've done, uh, my colleagues who've implemented OVAL, some of them have done uh, optimization in, in OVAL. So they cut some of the branches and they make it a bit more performant. But uh, it really depends on the content. We try to make the content fast. But sometimes, for some policies, we really need to check all files. So in this case, it's, it's slow because there's no way to make it fast. Yes? Uh, regarding this more CVEs, uh, are you using the public CVE databases or do you integrate the CVE in the policy file? So the question was, for the CV scanning, are we using public CV databases, or do we integrate the CV policies, uh, the CV data in the policies? You can do both. Uh, in in Atomic Scan, for example, we download the public CV feed and we use it directly. But in Escape Security Guide, uh, in this example, it's not visible. But sometimes there are rules like uh, is. Are there vulnerabilities, or Jan can? If uh, the software is actually up to date and. There are basically two approaches. Uh, uh, we use um, the official uh, CV or OVO content from the distributions. Uh, this uh, content is available not just for Red Hat, but also for other distributions like SUSE, etc. So in the cases where the CV data is available, we are using the official content. So the question was, from the time when a vulnerability is published to the time when it's available in the policy, uh, like how much is that? Well, 
That's a question that I cannot reliably answer. It's a pretty hard question, really. It depends on, on a lot of factors. <clears throat> for example, for some vulnerabilities that cannot really be exploited, uh, they may never show up uh, in the CV databases. Usually the vendors, they only include uh, vulnerabilities that customers care about or their users care about. The answer, like, uh, depends on many factors here, like, um, the primary factor uh, is uh, the importance of the security flow, like, if it's critical, important, and uh, the, like, uh, period in which they are processed is then shorter. Like, uh, in, uh, for critical uh, flows, uh, it would be very short, and for, like, low uh, security flows, they might not even get into into the policy. Thanks for your attention. We are out of time. Uh, we'll be around. So. I wouldn't want to go through, through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for questions. Hello. Thank you for your question. Oh, I, I have one already. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. yeah. I've already got one. I have, yeah. I have told you that you have another question. Like. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. No, sorry. Sure. It was a good presentation. I enjoyed it. Oh. So, yeah. Thank you. If you have like more questions, so feel free to check okay, it out. Okay, I will. I've, I've never used it. Um, largely because I didn't understand the capabilities. Um, but I. I it was very interesting. So okay. I might have to play with it. There are, there are a lot of uh, things done and uh, a lot of things uh, ahead of us, and it might uh, seem confusing. Like, you know, oh, why all, all of these tools? Like, why each functionality is uh, separated in, in some uh, new tool? Yeah. Like, well, people rather like, have one tool doing everything, but the mod modularity gives, out, gives us the possibilities and the functionality we can integrate. and yeah. So it's. No, I understand, and I think this, um, the capabilities are so cool that if you can integrate it, yeah, like yeah. You're saying with all the, different, yeah. all the different tools that we have at Red Hat, uh, that would be great. Yeah, so, okay. So you don't want it? I, I'm all set, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Můžete poprosit o prezentaci na flešku, až budeš mít to čas. So there are several the, problems. Some sort of cooperation with the guys who wrote this. That's all for Chitito? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the way it works is Red Hat publishes an update in Arata. Yeah. And, uh, and there's some metadata, like which one of these it fixes and so on. And when it's public, uh, we have some sort of script.